Welcome back to the Fuel Your Legacy podcast. Each week, we expose the faulty foundational mindsets of the past and rebuild a newer, stronger foundation essential in creating your meaningful legacy. We've got a lot of work to do, so let's get started. As much as you like this podcast, I'm certain that you're going to love the book that I just released on Amazon, Fuel Your Legacy, The Nine Pillars to Build a Meaningful Legacy. I wrote this to share with you the experiences that I had while I was identifying my identity, how I began to create my meaningful legacy and how you can create yours. You're going to find this book on Kindle, Amazon, and as always on my website, samnickerbacher.com. Welcome back to the Fuel Your Legacy Show. And today we have another incredible guest, man. I am so excited for the people that we get stacked up on this. I was just talking with uh, before with Michael about how at this point in the podcast, I get a lot of offers and I only choose to interview the people that I really feel are going to bring the most value to you and uh, maybe a little bit selfishly, the most value to me as I interview them. And so uh, he, I'm not going to be able to go through all of his accolades. He's going to tell us his story. But a few things I do think are important to know about Michael is he spent years, years and years and years in the corporate world, but he finally decided, you know what, it's time to be an owner operator and move out on his own, built a seven figure company in the digital business acquisition operations expert area. What I like about one of the things that he's going to talk about um, and one of his, uh, I don't know if I, his catchphrase is the right word, you know, but, but potentially that it's easier to buy something rather than build something. And so many people, they stay out of certain markets because they feel like they have to build it and it's overwhelming. What if you could use your skills? You don't have to have the development building skills, but what if you could go in and buy something that's already working that you love doing and, and move in the direction that way. So that's, I don't know. There's so many things I'm excited about on this podcast. Hopefully we can get to all of them. But if not, it's going to be great either way. And we can always have him back. So if you really love what he says, then then just ask him. We can have him back. So Michael, go ahead and tell us a little bit about how you started. How did you get from where you were in the very beginning of your life, you know, up to where you are? And why why did you step out and do it on your own rather than stay in the corporate? Wow, that's a great introduction. Thank you so much. I, I hope I live up to the expectations that we set too, here. If but, you don't. Uh, thanks again. Yeah, thanks again for having me here. <laughs> So yeah, I'd love to give a little of my story because I think it's something that a lot of us, um, so I come from an engineering developer background and a lot of us have very much the same past and kind of some of the same challenges as we're moving through. We're at the late 2023 right now um, after the pandemic and everything and things have changed in the engineering world. So I come from a background where parents were in the military, so very middle class, moved a lot as a child. Um, and I'll say to people that do move a lot or have to change schools quite often, it is not the best thing when you're young, but as you get older and you see how often people are changing jobs, jumping into new groups, new people that you have to meet, the skills you learn as a kid when you're moving so much actually become very beneficial as you grow older. And so I wasn't even able to stay in the same college for an entire four years. I did two years at UCLA and then decided, hey, I'm getting that itchy bug to uh, move again. And I switched over to Indiana as well, so finished up there. Um, So my background and education all pointed me in the direction to be a developer and engineer. So that was my first job out of school is I started doing artificial intelligence engineering way back then, which was almost 20 years ago. And so it's obviously changed quite a bit and finally has hit the mainstream uh, usage, which is something we could have really enjoyed back then. But I went through the typical kind of the dot-com phase. So when I came out, we were in that first internet wave. Everyone was excited for the internet and pets.com. Everyone was moving to Silicon Valley. I did the same thing, became a consultant out there. And this is where I started to realize that it's very different than what you see on TV and on the news and in all those stories of how your day-to-day life is really going to be. Because in the end, you are just working at the computer. You're not quite making the same friends that you were in college. And I think a lot of us come through that when you leave school and it's a little bit of a different lifestyle than you expect. So I worked as a consultant and traveled or wrote code and stayed in the same home office for about five years before I had what I would say is my first quarter life crisis. And that was really the genesis of starting to look at what else could I be doing with this background in education that would be more rewarding for me. Because I had reached that point where I think a lot of us have, especially in engineering where we do get paid quite well, 
you can't buy a car that's fast enough and you can't take a vacation that's enjoyable enough to make you want to go back to work on Monday morning. And that's when you start hitting that point and you start thinking, this is where I need to figure out what am I supposed to be doing with my life? Because this probably isn't it. A challenge that I think a lot of engineers have is we're so specialized in this world that even after the quarter life crisis and I took six, maybe seven months off, I went right back into the same thing because we don't sometimes see ourselves able to work outside of that area. You get a bit of the golden handcuff problem where you make so much, it's very hard to switch careers and then go make even 50% of what you were making before. So I went back into it with a different plan and looked at going back to school and getting an MBA at the time thinking that that might send me in a different direction. Again, after the NBA, I went through what I would say is the second quarter life crisis, still thinking, hey, this just isn't quite right for me. What else can I do? What else is what my life goal really wants to be in the direction that I want to go where I'm having fun and enjoying what I'm doing? And when we're in the corporate world, we always see all the things that we don't like. We have managers that don't treat us very well. We have a lot of meetings that we don't really need to be at and you have to go to. And you don't actually get to do your work. And in my kind of my view of what I wanted my world to be is I wanted to be spending my eight hours a day actually doing something meaningful. And so many of the projects we do in the corporate world don't ever go live, really don't have a lot of meaning. You can't really understand why you have to do them. Somewhere in this second sabbatical kind of takeoff time, I came across the idea of trying to acquire a business instead of trying to build it. I think a lot of your listeners, many of us have tried to build businesses because that seems to be what is advertised as the way to get out of the corporate world. You want to get out of the corporate world, start your side hustle, start your side consulting gig, and try and make that reach the point of the same income that you're you're making today, and then move out and run on your own. And that's perfectly viable. But for people like me, where I'm an operator, I'm not so much an entrepreneur, it's a lot harder for me to go from zero to one than it is for me to take something from one and take it to 10. And so I've always kind of gone with that operator role where I'm really good at running things, but just not starting them. And so when I came across the acquisition lifestyle where you go out and you actually buy projects and you buy businesses that A, you think it'd be fun to run, B, of course, you get to run it all yourself and C, give you that flexibility to be the operator and not the starting entrepreneur. That fit really well with what my skill set had grown to be through the corporate world. And suddenly I realized, okay, this is what I should have been doing all along. Maybe I wouldn't have started it from the beginning because it was really beneficial to get that corporate experience. But once I got going and acquiring these businesses and acquiring these projects, I could see a situation where I wish someone had told me 15 years earlier that this was a career path that was out there for me. And I probably would have planned my career a little bit differently, saved a little bit more money, tried to work in multiple departments like marketing, accounting, so that I would get that experience. So when I went out on my own, I would be a better business person and able to manage those projects. So now for the past decade, that's what I've been doing. It's just acquiring projects in different businesses, things that I think would be fun to run, teams and tech stacks that I enjoy working with. I spend all day talking to other engineers, which is really rewardable for me, rewarding for me. And it's just built into a really great career that I did not see 10 years ago because I just didn't have a mentor that had brought this up. So that's one of the reasons I'm here is just to help other people be aware that there's an opportunity to acquire a business instead of starting it. And just like you said, where you want to buy and then build it and you kind of acquire and you, um, one of my clients used the term, um, you're just buying momentum. And that's really helpful because we all know when we're starting a business on our own, how hard it is to get that momentum and that first customer and that MVP working with um, a good market fit. I think that's so cool. So the, the question then is like, is this really what life was meant to be? Right. right. Is this really yep. what I worked so hard for? And so many people, they ask that question too late in life or yeah. They never ask it. They've been so brainwashed that they actually believe that that's what life was meant to be. And I think you're right. And I, I see that in um, a lot of my colleagues and um, my stepkids, uh, the same challenge where some of their friends are saying, this is just how it is, you know, and we're, we're stuck in this career. We don't have the option to change. And, you know, I recognize you can't change right away. Um, what I'm trying to propose requires capital investment, requires discipline, requires some experience, but that doesn't mean you can't start planning it. 
And that's kind of the thought is, you know, our careers are quite long now. I think you can say your generation and my generation, I don't really expect to retire. That's probably not a concept that will exist. So we have plenty of time to plan this. But yeah, you don't have to feel so stuck. You do need to ask yourself those questions, maybe quarterly. Is this what I should be doing? Is this what brings me reward and sets up that legacy for your life? Yeah, and so much, at least for me, and one of the reasons I started the podcast is I find that so many people are living quiet lives of desperation. They actually don't believe that they have anything outside of this and they lose their identity. They lose their soul to corporate America. And one of the, you know, somebody's going to write this book before me because I keep saying it out loud. And, you know, one of these people, somebody's going to grab onto this, listen to Sam's podcast and be like, you know what? It's time. I'm going to write that book for Sam. And I'm going to be happy for you. And I'm going to read it and I'm going to shout it out and you can come on my podcast. But the, the title of the book is How I Escaped Corporate Prostitution. Okay. Because that's what it is. He calls them golden handcuffs, but it isn't golden handcuffs. It's not like some nice thing. It's corporate prostitution. You go to the highest bidder, the highest payer, and you go from job to job to job to the highest one because you think that that's all you're good for. And the, the crazy thing is, and, and I, I know that Michael's going to agree with me on this, is if you have a job, you are by definition underpaid. That's just the reality of it. Your skill set is bringing in more value for that employer than they're compensating you for. If it ever flips, you get fired. Okay? If, that, if that ever changes, you lose your job. Okay, so you are by. You should take that as confidence rather than feeling like, man, I'm underpaid and this is so unjust and whatever. As long as you work for somebody else, you will chronically be underpaid. The only way to be compensated for the value you're bringing to society is to go ask for that value by yourself and become the owner operator or the business owner, whatever it is. Okay. And you might feel like the person at the top, I do more work than them. They're overpaid. Look, the CEO is not overpaid. He's finally, he's learned how to get his value. There's a big difference. Okay. The thought processes, the mental composure, everything that you think, well, he just takes vacations all the time. He's working 24 seven in his head, 24 seven. And the amount of stress management he has to compose himself for versus you just have to get your job done by the deadline. It's not even anywhere close to the same. So the job description is different. Anyways, I think that that's important to recognize because the next question I was going to ask you is where do you, where did you find the confidence to finally step out and do something for yourself. Cause that's a bit, there's a lot of people who they get to the point where they recognize, okay, I'm worth more. They get to the point where they recognize I could do something else. Maybe, but it's still the confidence. And then if you're married, you've got a wife and you've got a kids and you've got a house and you've kind of built this life for yourself that making that jump is scary. Even if you feel like you have some guaranteed soft landing somewhere, it's still scary, you know? So like, how did you get the confidence that, you know what, I know I'm gonna be successful, I'm gonna go do this. Fantastic question, because I bump into engineers and developers all the time, and their first question is, you know, like, how do I do this? It sounds like exactly what I'd like to do. I just, I can't bridge that gap. And they're speaking about all of those challenges. Like you said, it's the golden handcuffs and you've got family. And even if you have a soft landing, you're not sure. For me, one of the ways I did it was I started small. So I, my first acquisition was just a small five-figure Amazon affiliate site to kind of understand what world am I looking at? Can I run a business? Is this something I would find enjoyable? So that was a nice baby step. And there's a constant debate of should you start small like, like that situation and use that as kind of your leapfrog into this type of career? Or should you save all your money and buy something really large, which gives you a lot more leeway? And there's an argument for both of them. But for me personally, it was to start with that small business and I thought, okay, this is absolutely fantastic. I'm running my own hours. Um, we don't have any meetings. We do everything asynchronously when we want to. This is fantastic. How do I double down on this? And so that was the way that I started to move into it. Um, and I think it's different for other people. I've worked with some of my clients who were coming straight from you know, AWS and wanted to go and buy almost the exact same project that they're working on that was for sale um, with a broker. And for them, that's an easy transition. They know when they're sitting in their corporate office, like, if I could take this project on my own, I could take this to the moon. The problem is you can't do that in corporate. When they could go out and buy the exact same project outside, they went off and running. And so sometimes people will see that opportunity as well. By bringing this kind of awareness out there and changing your mindset so you're always thinking about the opportunity to acquire this kind of a career, 
that might help people quite a bit, whether they're doing a small step like I did or recognizing an opportunity in the market in the first place. Well, and that's so building your awareness. So there's this law and I'm sure you've heard about it um, called the law of attraction, right? They talk about it in like the, well, the, the book, the secret, but they talk about it in a lot of success books. Um, Think and grow rich is probably the, the main area where it was coined, but the question is, what's the law of attraction? Is the law of attraction that you just decide something and it starts coming to you like a magnet? Or is the law of attraction that the more you think about it, you're more attracted to it, you're more aware of it. And so then you don't stop thinking about it and you see the opportunity more. Like who's the one being attracted? And it, from my understanding, based in my own life experiences, the law of attraction is definitely the more I think about it, I'm more attracted and see the opportunities. So awareness is a huge, huge key. So let's let's take that question one step further, right? The confidence maybe is, is awareness, but how do you start becoming more aware? What are some daily practices, daily habits you could do to just start becoming aware of these other options? Absolutely. So in the developer engineering world, um, thankfully, this is a group of people that are very aware of the startup community and are very aware of indie development. So our minds are already about halfway there because we've seen so many people start from nothing or start with acquiring something and taking that forward. I think the bigger challenge is when you're in different types of corporate environments where entrepreneurship is not as common, it's much harder to see that and start looking for those opportunities. So my suggestion is you have to kind of immerse yourself in communities that are looking for opportunities quite often. Whether that's masterminds, whether that's reading books, whether that's newsletters, it does change your mindset over time. And I will have, you know, you can attest to this as well. You'll sit down with a colleague of yours and you'll see a situation and both of us will see two different things. Possibly they see a barrier or they see a new regulation that's gonna hurt their business where you and I might look at it and say, wow, this is kind of an interesting new opportunity because you could do X, Y, and Z. So changing that mindset, I know a lot of self-help is trying to get people to look at it that way. But if the environment you're in, and I'm kind of thinking some, some certain verticals where entrepreneurship is not very common, you might have to spend a little time getting outside of that, doing some different meetups, finding different networking groups to help your mind start looking for opportunities instead of always seeing barriers and feeling that you're hemmed in. Yeah, I, I think that's huge. So get getting involved with people who see opportunities and not problems is is crucial. And I so I this podcast is a perfect example, right? Like if I came across, I, I always think some of the most influential podcast episodes I've ever heard were completely random. It just happened to switch on to it, and then I heard someone talking about something, and I thought, man, that is something I really want to get into. You know, and I'm sure you'll have a couple people that listen to this and think. I gosh, why am I not acquiring businesses instead of for the eighth time trying to start a new one? That comes from exposing yourself to different ideas, different groups, and just even different podcasts. Yeah. And on, on this note here, because we're talking about acquiring businesses and I don't know, every, every listener is going to be a little bit different, but I think sometimes when you hear that acquiring businesses as a, as a phrase, um, we look at a business, um, how do I say this? Not we, because you and I look at it differently. But a lot of people, when they look at a business, they aren't business owners. They're at best employees, but a lot of people, they're just straight up consumers. They aren't even employees. They don't even understand from an employee perspective how a business works. So they see it as this big, crazy, daunting thing, owning a business, let alone building a business. And building a business is even more daunting, but just like owning the business is like, oh, there's so much work. There's so much paperwork. There's so much management and upkeep. And then like, if you own... Uh, a landscaping company, you've got to manage people and you've got to manage all this other stuff. And I want to, the reason I'm highlighting this and, and kind of bringing up all those negative things you might think, look, those are actual barriers of entry for a lot of people. Okay. They're, they're massive barriers of entry for a lot of people. There are industries though, that don't have the same type of demand on you as the owner. And that's another thing that Michael spent a lot of time in is in the SaaS world, which for those of you who don't know what SaaS stands for, it's S-A-A-S, -A which stands for software. Um, oh man, now I just forgot it. Software as a service. Yeah, software as a service. I was like, why did I just forget that? It was in my head in the first one. So uh, software, software as a service. And I'm not saying that software is just like willy-nilly, doesn't ever need updates, doesn't ever need, uh, like uh, it, it's easy to set up. That's not always the case. 
Okay, I'm not gonna sit here and tell you this. Ask any programmer. They're like, no, it's uh, there's always bugs. There's always changes. There's uh, there's always maintenance that has to happen. Okay, there is. But what's the value of software as a service type business over maybe owning a business that is has high high overhead um, and there's higher risk in it? Like, what? Why would you choose a SaaS type business or try and get into something like that over something else? I might even step that back a little bit and say, why would you get into online businesses instead of brick and mortar? And um, and software as a service is even more extreme on the online business. It, it's kind of two things. One, you can leverage a lot more with software because it's scalable. So in the offline world, every time a new customer comes in, if you double your customers, you're going to have to increase your staff, your fixed costs are going to increase, your variable costs increase. That isn't always true with online businesses because you can leverage software and you can leverage these kind of businesses without increasing staff and costs. So that once you hit that point where you're profitable and you can add customers and scale without all that extra cost, that's what makes these kind of investments and these kind of careers so beneficial and really removes that cap that we were talking about earlier where if you're an employee, there has to be a profit margin above your head or else the company isn't going to continue to employ you. In my case, there is no profit margin that somebody's taking above my head. I can continue to grow. So that's what makes software as a service so fantastic is that it can scale with a lot fewer resources. And once you have something that's working and it's proven it's product market fit, you can kind of ex- uh, you know explore it all over in different areas, do different niches, um, expand horizontally and vertically. It just makes it a lot less friction and a lot lower barrier to entry for new entrants. Now, that means you have less of a moat, of course, because other people can come in and do the same thing. But that's where your marketing can stand out and your uh, all your other skills that hopefully you learn somewhere in the corporate world as well. Um, but that's what I think is so fascinating about software is that you can really expand on a good idea for a much larger area than you could if you're doing a brick and mortar business that's just landscaping within your zip code. You know, There you have a very set limit. Yeah, and I think that just to highlight uh, something you said there, there's so much about like this idea of competition that is overplayed. Guys, there's 8 billion people on this planet. 8 billion. For you to make a million dollars a year, okay, a million dollars a year, you need a thousand people to pay you a thousand dollars. That's it. And you're making a million dollars a year. Or you need 2,000 people to pay you 500 bucks a year, not a month, a year. So how much is that a month? You need a software that you can sell for 40 bucks a month, 40, 50 bucks a month to 2,000 people and you're a millionaire. Not, not a millionaire like just sitting in the bank, but you actually have a million dollar revenue. Now, again, I don't know the ex- exact numbers here, but if you had a SaaS service that had 2,000 paying clients at 40 bucks a month, what's the multiple on that that you could sell that for? Yep. Multiples change a little bit over time. So right now, so SaaS has the highest multiples. So if we're comparing it to, let's say, a content site or an e-commerce site or an Amazon FBA, SaaS is typically going to have the higher multiples um, because of exactly like what you said. It's got recurring revenue. So I can tell you it's August 20, or excuse me, it's October 27th, 2023. I can tell you pretty much within two or 3% what I'm going to make this year because that's how predictable the revenue is. That's one of the reasons it sells for so much more. Um, and just the customer stickiness to it as well. So the SaaS multiples can be anywhere from the low end would probably be about 3.5 to 4. And then you move up, um, kind of go up from there. There's always discussions on SaaS businesses, whether they should be sold for the revenue that they earn or the profit that they earn. And that becomes a conversation between the buyer and seller. Yeah, that's but yeah, if you have a SaaS, yeah, if you have a SaaS business that's got 2,000 customers and you're making 400 uh, you know, a year on that, you can do that math and realize, so not only am I making this cash flow during the year, I'm also sitting on an asset that's worth a couple million dollars. Um, that's a pretty hard equivalent thing to do in the corporate world because you're never really sitting on an asset other than your own talent and skills, where if you have your own SaaS business, that talent and skills gets turned into an asset through the company. Right. And people think, well, that sounds uh, too much. That's too big for my, my little mind. Uh, the most I've ever made is $50,000 a year. Fine. Let's talk about it. $50,000 a year. You want to be retired? You want to be done forever? I mean, obviously inflation is going to eat you alive, but um, l- let's say you're done for the next year. What do you need to make $50,000 a 
a year? Well, you need about a hundred clients, maybe a hundred people paying you 40 bucks a month and you're retired because the profit, this is the crazy thing. When you get a good system, when you go buy a system, the profit margin on running a SaaS company, that's like a, a pretty duplicatable. I mean, it's going to vary between company, but less than 10%, I would say most of them that I've seen, um, because they don't take a lot of effort past the ups, the setting up. Yeah. And so when you acquire it, you're skipping that whole step. Um, and so you're cutting the line and, you know, that's another phrase I use quite a lot. Um, which I stole from James Altucher, I think, um, you know, somebody else that's really good at going from that zero to one, like I was saying, they set it all up. When you acquire it, man, you've missed a lot of that hard part. You already have something that's proven. And then you look at it at the math and you say, boy, you're right. I'm going to make a million dollars this year. And all I had to do was acquire this and I can, all I can do is grow it. Um, so yeah, it, you're really cutting the line. You're buying that momentum. Um, it's just a fantastic way to take something from, um, an entrepreneur that really enjoys starting things. Cause that's something that's very common with entrepreneurs. And I've seen it from my entrepreneur colleagues, my, myself, they love starting things, but once you start getting into that operational part where they have to do marketing and then they start having customer service issues and they have to do taxes and billing and, you know, they want to go back to, you know, as soon as chat GPT came out, tons of businesses went for sale because everybody wanted to go play with that. And they wanted to offload what they were doing to people like me. And that's perfect. I'm their part of the business cycle where I take it to the next level and then I sell it to somebody else. So all of us exist in this cycle. And if you, if you like the starting part, that's perfect. If you want to do the longer part like me, do the operational, that's where I fit in. So it, it all works. But yeah, to go back to your comment about um, how good SaaS can be is just, yeah, you're really sitting on that asset that really gives you a ton of cash flow on. As yeah. Well. I, I just think that so many people are so much closer to freedom, like financial yeah, freedom, yeah. lack of stress, time freedom. You can run the SaaS company from anywhere in the world that you have internet. Like there, there's so much that people overlook simply because they don't understand or they think, oh, I, I'm not good with technology. You don't have to be good with technology. Technology is good with technology. Yep. Like <laughs> the and chat GPT I've can write of, better code than most code writers, unfortunately. For sure. <laughs> yeah. I've seen a lot of people that say, well, okay, Michael, but I don't know what company to start. You know, I, I don't know what, what idea should I go with? And to go back to your earlier comment, you know, worrying about competition, it's execution, right? None of these ideas are unique or special. Um, if you can do the execution, that's where the money is. And if you can't think of ideas to start, start going through broker listings. Like there's so many businesses that I see that I never would have thought of starting that looks super fun to run. And I just wish I had 15 more of myself and a ton more money to go out and buy these companies just to just to run them because I think they would be fun. I think the customers would be interesting. So if you're looking for ideas, go out and look at what's successful and what's on the marketplace um, and recognize it's execution. It's not coming up with something unique. Yeah. So uh, let's say, let's say they are going to go buy it. Cause there's this question of capital um, mm -hmm. actually having the capital to purchase it versus maybe creative financing it. Um, and in the mergers and acquisition space, we'll, we'll just call it that. Um, I don't know what level you have uh, been in that, but you took your MBA. So I imagine you have an idea of this, if not actually <laughs> doing it, but how many people really want a one-time buyout versus payment over time in the small business world, just from like a pure Great. tax and yeah. they, they built a Great income. question. How many of them yeah. want a one-time payout versus payment over time? You know what I've found is quite a few want that one-time payout because they want to completely focus switch, right? And they want to be done okay. with this. Um, typically, sometimes, you know, the, the seller sometimes has to stay on a little bit. They have to teach us the new business. And so it depends on the complexity of the business, how long they want to stay on. But um, most want to leave. And I start in my seller calls a little bit with your conversation of, you know, having cash flow is not a bad thing. If you ever want to go get a mortgage and you show them $8 million in the bank, they don't care. They care about your monthly cash flow. So it's good to kind of keep that. So why don't we look at maybe doing some seller financing for a couple of years so that while you're working on that next project and you're not making any money from that, you're still getting cash flow so that you can kind of keep that credit score going. You can do any life changes. Um, taxes is another thing that you brought up that I've also brought up on seller calls of you're, you're certainly welcome. You know, if we're buying it at the end of the year, you're going to pay taxes almost immediately. If we split this in half, you can we get the second half maybe in the beginning of the year, and then you don't have to pay that for a while. So at least you can sit on some of that money. So you're right. There are some ways to kind of look at it instead of taking it all at once. And I think in many situations, sellers are selling for the first time. So 
just becoming aware of, oh, there's different ways we can do this. Um, and it's just part of the negotiation and you're always trying to make it a win-win for everybody. And, you know, I'll always kind of approach it of like, you know, I've done this quite a few times now. Here's some things I've seen other sellers do that kind of help their life along for the next few years. And you still get the same amount of money. Um, you know, you still set up the seller loan so that inflation doesn't hurt them and everything like that. So yeah, there's the, the, the straight up answer is most seem to want the money up front. But kind of through conversation, you can kind of say, maybe let's do like 20, 30, or 40% in the future just to make your tax and your cash flow situation better. So, so, so I think you said something that's key though. Most want it up front. Do the people who actually understand business want it up front, or is it just all the newbies who don't understand what's going on and the things at play want it up front? Because I, I think, and, and this is just my perspective, I studied, you know, I, I look at it from a psychological perspective um, and people's emotional relationship with money. I think. The reason, in my experience, people want upfront things is because they're scared that it's going to default if they wait. Yeah, there's a fear that I won't pay you back, um, and I completely understand that. Sure, I mean, we're dealing with individuals. Every day. So, yes, so. yeah, we're dealing with individuals, and so one of the things I do um, that I think is kind of unique out here is when I'm kind of late in a negotiation, I actually go and fly and meet the person in person that's selling the business or the team. Um, just so we get that in person of like, hey, I'm I'm a real person. I'm not just somebody behind the camera on Zoom. Um, but that is kind of a concern of you know who do I sue if somebody doesn't pay me back? And I recognize that risk, right? And that's why we don't say, all right, let's do eighty percent pay later because I think that's too much for somebody to ask for, and it's it's too much stress on me that I'm basically taking care of someone for the next few years. So to answer your original question, uh, you know, I think new sellers are probably always going to not always, but you know, the default is like, Hey, I'd love to just sell this up front, move on to my next thing. Um, maybe more savvy and experienced are trying to set things up. And, you know, in my life, I would be looking at, you know, I've got all these other things that are going on. Maybe I want some cash flow here and everything and do taxes because I've got this big, big tax event coming up, you know, so people can set it up if you're a little savvy to just to make your own life better because your own personal tax situation is going to be different. Um, so those just, those are healthy conversations to have and, and say, you know, what works best for the buyer and the seller. Sure. Yeah. I, I think it's just a, an element that when you do go work with Michael or anybody in his position, you want somebody who's uh, understands both sides of the mindset, the, the, the side of the seller and the side of the buyer. And ultimately you're looking for a situation that benefits everybody, you know, and, and I'm a, I, I'm a proponent of small business ownership and there's plenty of giant corporations who can come in and just buy but I think there's a lot of people out there who don't necessarily want their project, their baby that they created to be swallowed up and eaten by some other corporation. Um, that is because they want to shut it down. Of, I mean, there's big corporations yeah. that buy your project for millions of dollars because it's cheaper than competing with you. And if you created something because you actually cared about what you were creating and you actually wanted to solve a problem in the marketplace and by selling it, you know that it's just going to get tabled. Then that can be very frustrating. And I've, I've interviewed people on my sure. podcast where that's happened. And then they went and bought their project back from the person who bought it from. I was like, Hey, this is stupid. You know, it obviously yeah. went down in value because they tabled it for years. But I think that that's another motivation that's not always spoken about upfront, but that can help you win over a higher bid offer. If you also are passionate about like what you you're looking at these and you're getting all excited like oh that'd be so fun to run the clients would be awesome you know you're not looking yeah. at like hey let's buy this to shut it down and so that's buyer, um buyers are aware of that yeah absolutely it's it's one of the things i bring up and you know i'll, I'll typically say like listen we're speaking today because i think your project is really fun i I identify with your customers because most of the stuff i buy is engineering tools or utilities you know i'm basically one of your customers this is something that we care about how this project matures. I know it's your baby. A lot of times people are selling maybe when they don't want to. Um, for example, one, I had a, a guy that was selling because his other business got an equity infusion and they had to run with that as his startup and he had to divest and everything else. So he didn't want this project to go bad. You know, he still cared about the customers. And so speaking to a, a fellow engineer who's going to take over the project made sense for him versus selling to a micro PE firm that was just going to farm out the process. And what I always say is if the person you're talking to during the negotiation, who would be Michael Frew, is not the same person you're talking to on closing day and when you start changing the operations over, that's where you're going to kind of have that disconnect between what they say in the beginning and who's really running the business. 
So that's why, you know, you're talking to me after the acquisition because I'm running the business, I'm the operator, and I'm the person behind the customer service queue as well. Um, so that is, I think, for some of the smaller projects that people that are on this podcast would be selling, you want to sell it to somebody that does care about it instead of just kind of that faceless, nameless thing that might shut it down. Yeah. And, you know, and, and if you started the project just to make money, then sell it for money, right? And there's nothing, there's yep. nothing wrong with either one. I'm just bringing it up for you because yeah. every person listening to this podcast, you've got dreams, you've got goals, you've got these things, and it's okay to care about them. It's also okay to just want to get wealthy, you know, and that's okay too. And I'm not shaming whatever your goal is, go get your goal. Um, but sometimes the ethical thing to do is to do it in a certain manner, you know, and sometimes it's fine just to go build something that makes money right now and that you can sell. There's nothing, there's nothing wrong or, or right with that. But one of the things that you mentioned kind of in the beginning is the, the feeling when you're working for somebody else or working in corporate America. But I think this can happen at every area of your life. Even if you're working for yourself, this is a huge, huge, good question to ask. Like, what are you wasting time on that doesn't add any value or meaning to your life? Right. There's so much, I, I, I think engineers tell me this more than anybody else. Like, oh, I've got these stupid meetings that I don't get any value from. I don't like, it burns them, but what do they do? They, they get paid to be there, and, but they would rather just be working on their little project. That's what they would love doing. <laughs> so how do, you, how do you help somebody? Because that can happen on the entrepreneur level, on the owner operator level, anytime you get tired or just like, eh, with something. How do you either reinfuse the joy into what you're doing or cut this stuff that you don't find joy in, but maybe somebody else would find joy in? This is a great question because I have found myself in this situation quite a bit where um, I had just mentioned, you know, hey, I'm helping with customer service. Am I actually providing any value that, that the fact that Michael Frew is doing it really makes it that much better? Or should I really be working on something else that gives me more reward and, and have a colleague of mine helping on customer service? So my suggestion is, as often as you can, quarterly, step back and look at where am I actually delivering value that only I can be adding? And if you can find those few spots and focus your 80% of your time on that and leave that 20% for all the things you kind of have to do that you're not adding value, that is how I have continued to grow my career, even in my own businesses. And um, other than that, let me think, give me one second to think about it. I think I'll leave it at that. You can okay. edit this. I have a follow-up yeah. question that uh, I was yep. talking to a friend the other day about. Uh, and I don't really know the answer. I haven't, I know what I've decided my answer is for at this point in my life, but I'm just curious. Um, and it kind of goes back to the the making money conversation, which again, yeah. there's nothing wrong with making lots of money and that being the objective and the goal of your life. Okay. So don't take this the wrong way. Um, but there is a point in my life that I've got to where like, there are things that I could do. There's things that I could eliminate from my life because they don't pay me the most, or it's not something like anybody could do it, you know? So like, why am I the one doing it when there's other things that only I can do? And the, the, the flip side is those things, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use like something simple, but mowing the lawn. I love mowing the lawn. Could I pay somebody to mow the lawn? Is it even worth my dollars per hour to mow the lawn? No, not really. But there's other fulfillment value that you get from doing things that are not necessarily the most financially <laughs> beneficial. And so how do you determine when and where to step away from the stuff that like there's it actually costs you money to go do this activity because your time is better spent somewhere else. But the, the, the emotional and spiritual reward of doing the activity is more. So maybe you love doing customer service and that's where you, like, you could own the company, but at the end of the day, you love being customer service. You love that conversation. You love the engagement. At what point do you say, look, even though I could run, be the CEO, I actually receive no fulfillment from that role or less fulfillment than I do from this lower paying job in, in, in my own business. How do you make that determination to say, no, I'm going to quit doing the thing I love to make more money or say, look, I'm going to hire somebody out to do what I could do, pay them more so I can do what I love doing. Like what's the balance? And, in this? Uh, this is such a good question because I, I, this is an internal battle I have quite often. Um, and 
right to your example of mowing the lawn. Um, there are things that are cathartic and therapeutic that I know really I shouldn't be doing when I know how much I make per hour. Right. <laughs> and, and that is, and I go back and forth on maybe I should have someone else doing that for me. Um, but then of course I get a lot of joy spending my Saturday morning kind of fixing up the yard. And so in the business, what I've found is I, I do get into ruts where sort of the, let's say, so I've got three companies right now. All three are running nice and smooth. I'm involved in the day-to-day operations. And you're starting to get into that place where there really isn't any reason for me to be here. I really should hire somebody else uh, to do it. And what gets me out of that is having new opportunities. And so you're constantly looking kind of to jump back to the beginning of our podcast here, constantly looking for new things that would be interesting for you to do, different ways to look at things. Um, So for me, when I come across new opportunities and you look at how much time that might take and you think immediately, oh, shoot. I should have been systematizing the rest of this business because I need to move on to this new thing. And so then you, you go back and you start systematizing that so you can make it and get the 80-20 moving in the direction with the new opportunity. So to me, I'm always thinking, hey, I may not know what's coming up next, but I should probably systematize this and get myself out of the process now so that when a good opportunity does pop up, I can move pretty quickly. It might lead you sometimes where you don't really have a lot to do because the systems are all running and everybody else is doing it, but it gives you the opportunity to jump on those, you know, new things that come across but you know if if you're thinking about it all the time trust me so am i so are you probably um it, it's a constant battle of where should i be spending my time um because you know our culture it's work 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 but there's so much of that therapeutic part that you need and sure you could pay someone else to do it but you need that as well so it's a balance for every person and trust me it's a it's a balance for me every day that i'm always trying to think about well i think something that you brought up that um at least for me is a good insight hopefully it's good for the listeners as well but you know it maybe you do like that lower paying role for lack of a better word um but if you approach all of your roles with excellence and with the mind of one day, I'm not going to be doing this. And you create a system, you can easily replace yourself. You can go do that same role in a new company to get the next company going. And so you don't right. actually have to stop doing it. You just go do it with a different company, right? So but let's take real estate and remodeling. Maybe you love remodeling. Well, you're not just going to sit there and remodel the same house over and over and over. Cause at some point, yeah, you're done remodeling that house. That doesn't mean you have to stop remodeling. That also doesn't mean it has to take 30 years for you to re- remodel one house. Cause once you've remodeled it, you don't need to remodel it again. Right? No, you, you do the remodeling, you feel the satisfaction, you build it, and then you go remodel starting at ground zero again, or in your case, you're, you're buying something that's not ground zero, but close. You know? Yeah. And, and but it's ground zero from, for me. Yeah. You go from a one or two to a 10 in that business. And then you go to the next business, you're still getting that same repetitive um, remodel type feeling that you're in the dirt, the, the, the dirt's in your nails, you know, you're really loving it. And still you're building your empire, one building at a time or one business at a time, rather than just rehashing the same business. So that's a good insight. Cause I like, it's a great certain, analogy. Uh, I yeah. like certain aspects uh, that I'm just like, man, is this worth my time? But maybe I need to shift and do it the same thing with a lot of different things rather than just keep doing the same one because I like doing it. Okay. Such a great analogy. And you're right that it, that first year when you buy, you know, so software SaaS businesses, they're pretty complicated in the sense of like, you got to figure out a lot of code and, you know, I don't really touch and do too much when we first acquire them, but that's such an exciting time because that's exactly when you get into the customer service, you get into the project management and all the planning and that stuff you don't do in the older businesses because those are all running. So you're right. It's a great analogy to think of re, um, refurbishing and rehabbing houses. Um, you love that process, but you can't keep doing it on the same house over and over. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Anyways, huge. That, that was, that was huge. awesome. And then the, the last thing just to touch on before, before we go, you mentioned a phrase in the beginning called buying momentum. I think that was the phrase you used. That's what yep. I wrote down yeah. anyways. Go, go a little bit more into detail about that and then maybe how that might apply, not just in business, but in other areas of your life, whether it's a relationship, parenting, like other things where this concept of momentum and how do you adopt momentum that's already there um, by association rather than um, always having to be the one that's creating the momentum. Excellent. Yes. So buying momentum was, again, one of my clients mentioned it and that's a mindset shift. So going back to our looking at the world a little bit different, 
Um, when you're trying to start something from scratch, right, you, it just hasn't, the flywheel is not moving. And a lot of us do enjoy getting that moving, but when you can step forward and just buy that momentum, you're going to end up going a lot farther, a lot faster. And, it, you know, to step back and you had asked about how, so how do you apply that to other parts of your life? Things like listening to podcasts and hearing people that have done things that all of a sudden, that leapfrogs you past a little bit of what you were expecting. Um, that's another way to kind of buy that momentum without doing it from the start. Um, so that's the, again, changing that mindset, exposing yourself to different things, whether it's podcasts or books or different communities that helps you skip the line, buy that momentum and kind of jump on the train that somebody else has started for you or with you. Yeah. And just something as you're, you're saying that I'm thinking of like maybe in a, a family or relationship situation, you can try and always create something or like my kids just started sports, right? I could go and try and create a sports team or I can go find a sports team that already exists and put my kids on that sports team, buying that momentum or another area in my business, um, or, or relationships is, Hey, if you want to improve your relationship, go find great relationships and, and go connect with them and build those relationships of mentorship. So you're, you're building into momentum. I heard a podcast yesterday was yesterday, not a podcast, a, a little reel. And they said, look, um, the best way to change who you are and become somebody different is who you are right now. You became that person. Like you already became somebody. And so if you want to be somebody different, then find out who that person is. And when I say find out who that person is, go into your soul and determine who you want to be. What, what, what type, type of clothes are they going to wear? What type of language are they going to use? What type of, how do they do their hair? Um, what do they look like? What are their interests? <laughs> and then you just start obsessing over that person and you created them. You created their name, you created everything. And pretty soon you just become that person because you become obsessed right. with that person. And anybody can recreate who they are really quickly if you clearly define who you want to be and then obsess about being that person and start acting as if you're that person, you'll become that person. Absolutely. Yeah. So, and then the mind can be so pliable like that, you know, and we think we're so stuck kind of going back to what we were saying. We think we're so stuck and we can't change anything. And it's amazing how quickly you can see those results if you have that mindset shift. Yeah, absolutely. Love it. Well, Hey, I appreciate uh, your time, Michael. And so, so many questions. How would somebody get a hold of you if they were like, you know, I'm in this position, I'm an engineer, or maybe they're just a, not an engineer. Maybe there's a person that wants to buy something rather than go and build it. They see themselves as an operator. They see themselves as really good in that area, but they don't really have the entrepreneurial bug where they want to go always uh, be building something from the beginning. Where would they contact you to see if they could get another conversation or insight yep. or direction? Yeah. So super simple. Um, so I've got my own website. It's just michaelfrew.com. Um, you can do forward slash fuel your legacy. Um, so it'll be a page just for this episode to kind of direct you to things that we, I took some notes. I'll direct you to some of the things I brought up. Um, and I talk to engineers that reach out of, you know, Hey, this is something I'd be interested in doing. Like, where do I get started? Um, I've got a video series on there of the same four questions I get from engineers and developers every time uh, I started to notice a trend that, you know, people are going to ask, why do people sell profitable businesses? How do I get the financing for it? How do I know what niche I should do and what's suitable for me? Right. Those four questions are the first ones I always get. So I just put together a whole series of me just answering for all of them. It's free. Um, it's right there on michaelfrew.com. So just reach out, shoot me an email. Um, I love to talk to anybody and try and help them with, you know, kicking off this career. Awesome. Well, hey, thank you so much. I highly recommend at least a conversation uh, after you listen to the podcast, because if you didn't listen to the podcast and use his free resources, don't go ask him the same four questions he already made a video to answer. I mean, like, give him the respect of his time and, and go and say, hey, here's some follow-up questions I came up with. Okay. Do as much. So it's such a hard balance, right? I want to say do as much as you can by yourself before you go and ask for help. Also, don't be embarrassed to ask for help, but it is kind of frustrating if you're rehashing the same conversation, like there's, there are systems for that. So, so be respectful of the people you, you get mentored but from Michael or anybody else on the podcast, do, do your homework a little bit, um, and use all those resources. So thank you so much. And we'll catch, we'll catch you guys next time on the fuel, your legacy show. 
Thanks for joining us. If what you heard today resonates with you, please like, comment, and share on social media. Tag me. And if you do give me a shout out, I'll give you a shout out on the next episode. Thanks to all of those who've left a review. It helps spread the message of what it takes to build a legacy that lasts. And we'll catch you next time on Fuel Your Legacy. Legacy.